This is another episode of Reflections with Val. Of course, we have me, Sophie underscore Val, and our new guest. I'm going to have him introduce himself. Go right ahead. Yeah, um, I go by MF Cowboy. You can call me just Cowboy, Cowboy Richie. NF Cowboy? Motherfucking Cowboy. <laughs> what is, that's what that stands for. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what is your real name? Where are you Glenn. from? <laughs> Yeah, What's your audience though? I, I'm Glenn. I'm from Texas and currently here in Jersey. Been here about a year, year and a half. It's a change. It's a drastic change. When did you move from Texas to Jersey? November before the snow that y'all had. About no, not last like November. literally this November that just passed. Not la- no, not last November, but the November before. Because apparently this winter wasn't as bad as the last winter. Yeah, it wasn't. And that. It was a week before that snow that caught everybody by surprise. It was like on a Tuesday at 2 o'clock. And y'all don't know how to drive in snow. And yeah, for sure. That's automatic from Texas to Jersey. Texans know how to drive better in snow than Jersey or people <laughs> or just no one. Well, nobody knows how to drive. <laughs> Let's just be uh, real because I was going to be like. <laughs> yeah, there ain't no snow in Texas. I mean, if it snows in Texas, oh yeah, that's so true. Yeah, it's about an inch, enough to make a footprint, and then you know they. But that has there's stuff that that has happened, you know, where like in states where it doesn't at all. Now it's happening, even in California where it was raining. Yeah, I mean, it took a lot of abnormal climate <laughs> climate changes, and yeah, you got La Nina and El Nino and all them Ninas and. You just, it, it's crazy. Global warming's happening. You got ice in the Polar Express up there melting, like, all the time. You got polar bears moving south. I mean, it's just, the world's going to hell. Yeah, it is. <laughs> he said it's going to hell. I mean, I just heard that, like, the North Pole, or the coldest part, was very warm. And it's been getting warm for years, and no one, no, not even scientists have been able to do anything to stop it. And now we kind of want to change everything into into what they were trying to warn us about. All of the people who are like, global warming, you need to pay attention. And blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, let's save a couple hundred trash bags and we'll save the planet. I mean, <laughs> it don't make sense. I mean, now we're using, like, box straws <laughs> made out of cardboard. and. I mean, it's just like in Texas, they threw us all for a loop when they started putting beer in plastic bottles. <laughs> beer and plastic bottles they do that in texas yeah during a concert i went to this uh one concert and went to go get a, a beer from the stand and you know a long neck bottle you're thinking it's a bottle and damn thing plastic look like a bottle but it's plastic it's just so nobody pops it over somebody's head that's smart we gotta hop yeah, on that i mean it takes away some of the effect of drinking really Mm, to me yeah (laughs) (laughs) so besides you living in texas and stuff like that let's let's go to what you do so your audience can know or my audience can know what is your main thing that you're doing right now in life like right now i'm supporting the women's movement i stumbled across pro women's football this this league wfla okay and started out as a fan and got to know some of the players and women athletic women and yeah i mean any type of woman i mean you could be a big in and still play football and so i just saw that it was a cool idea and they get to actually get paid to play as opposed to other leagues that the Don't. player themselves mm-hmm. have to pay and no insurance so if the player gets hurt they gotta pay it out of their own hip national so this league is started created by a woman and pretty much everybody in it is female and got great owners like Ja rules the owner of the new york stars which i'm a fan of the stars and the stars are the new york women's football team new york stars and that's the abbreviate the (laughs) yeah short term for it yeah just stars yeah there's no abbreviation (laughs) just stars um and so, yeah, that's my audience. And so I created a IG show at first to spotlight the players, have them come on, talk about, you know, que- give them questions from a fan aspect. Yeah. Because you watch sports, you'll see commentators, sports broadcasters that are professionals or coaches that are 
asking players questions. Mm -hmm. And so I asked some of the players, I'm like, why, like, why have we not seen anything about fans asking players? Like, I don't see any show on ESPN that talks about that. And they thought it was a good idea. So Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'll do it. And so it started out IG and then I decided to do podcasting. And so I moved over to podcasting. Now it's a mixture of both. So now it's a mixture of podcasting and you doing the IG Yeah, the IG live. live. And so I'll just... Yeah, but that's more of like yeah. your, what, you do, what you enjoy doing. I'm talking about what you do now in life, like profession-wise. Is that your full-time job or... Oh, okay. That's what I'm talking about. We're talking... <laughs> the whole point of Reflections is bringing life and craft to one. Okay? I want to know your life, what you've gone through, your failures your obstacles and how you've combat each one right so i want to get to those levels eventually but what i want to know is what do you do besides that craft and that love and that side hustle that you have well currently i work as a factory worker okay and you know it it ain't glamorous but it's It's your nine to five right right yeah close enough so what and you would truly enjoy doing is doing the ig tv the ig live right and the podcasting for that, sure that's where the passion my like if i I'd, if i didn't stumble across that i would just be going to work and going back into this you know one room apartment kind of thing and just staring at four walls and so <laughs> staring it, at four walls well i mean <laughs> other than watching youtube i mean i, I do get out sometimes but now that I have this, now my mind's focused on that. My my time is is put into up. that, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, whether it's scheduling, whether it's promoting, all that sort of thing. So basically, you know, it saved me from going insane, basically. And then, to be honest, I like the way you set up your flyers. I do <laughs> like the way you put them. I don't know if you do them yourself. Oh yeah. Yeah. How do you even go about? doing them you know like where do you where do you go to get them done oh it's it's a trade secret um <laughs> yeah I like that yeah, i just i downloaded an app called canva okay and, and i just i go through the templates that they have and then it's like i'll just remove their pictures replace yeah them. yeah no i got you i use canva too yeah, i do so. it comes in handy see you could be just like me <laughs> i mean we're getting there we're working on it you know it's just that we're trying to all do what we love and without any limitations and allowing life to get in the way of it all right so now growing up in texas um what was your family life like responsibility and hard work like growing up on a ranch you just oh really you had a ranch yeah so you've had animals yeah horses and cows and sheep and goats and pigs and all them critters Did you have any swans or ducks or no? No, no. Swans will chase you. So we didn't. Oh, I've had. When I was growing up in Puerto Rico, I was partially raised there for like seven years. So I came here. We had all that. We had swans, ducks, dogs. We never had cats. We always had the dogs to guard, you know, Mm -hmm. roosters, chickens. But yeah, we had cats. We had a lot of cats and cats were just mainly there to get the mice or snakes or whatever so (laughs) you know but it it was one of those lives where you know we we rode the bus to school but you had chores to do before the bus came so waking up at four in the morning going and feeding the horses putting the hay out for the cows and so what happened what would happen if you guys didn't do that like and your parents would just do it themselves and they would have to do it or yeah i mean basically yeah dad would do everything and he actually worked in the, so there was know. a scheduled time to feed every purse every animal yeah everybody had a job to do you know that was i mean and you'd they'd get started giving us allowance later on but it was more of the fact that dad wanted to teach us values and how to be responsible how to take care of your stuff you know did you would you say that that definitely taught you that Oh, yeah. Earning that and growing on that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, in those younger years. Yeah. Yeah. It it was a great childhood. I mean, of course, you know, that that was during the era. If you got in trouble, you got your ass whipped. So I don't sorry. I don't know if we can. No, no, we can't. We can. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I don't know if you heard my other episodes, but yeah, we uh, definitely can. You know, some some people frown upon that. But uh, but yeah, it was like, I mean, you actually got uh, in trouble and. You know, I 
accepted every butt whooping that came my way. It wasn't like, oh, you know, I've even taken some butt whoopings for my sister, but. I mean, are um, you the, where are you at of the siblings that you have? How many are you? And I'm the oldest and uh, okay. about four years. So I'm pushing 39. So, or I am 39. Yeah, I'm 30. I'll be 39 in December. And so my sister's like 36. Really? Yeah. Mm, so. so she's your only one? <clears throat> yeah, it's just two of us. After my parents had two kids, they they, they were done. So that was the end of the baby factory. <laughs> no so. more babies after that. Uh, no, no. Dad didn't want any more. He was, like, he, he, he was good enough. Yeah. So growing up in that ranch with your sister... Did you have moments where you had to step in and kind of defend and be there for your sister and moments of that nature, teach her things that your parents didn't have time for, or you kind of just... Well, I've stepped in a lot, and that's what gave me some of the ass whoopings. But um, there were some times when, when I could tell she was about to do something wrong, I would, you know, explain to her, this is how, you know, i do it. But mainly in, in that aspect, mom... And my sister, you know, they did the housework. And so it was mainly cooking and kind of thing. It, it's almost like the 50s kind of way where the men outside, they took care of everything. And the, Yeah, it is. The woman in, in the, in the house, house. You know, <laughs> did all the decorating, that sort of thing. And so... Growing up, getting out of grammar school and still living... Were you still living in the ranch, living all your ways through high school, or you kind of moved out? It was more, we started moving out uh, through the high school years. Um, and with Dad's work, it moved us around a couple places in, in Texas, but more or less we spent, you know, eight years in one spot in a small town, and that's where the country part came in at. And then, then we got transferred, and when they, they moved dad, we had to sell the horses and sell everything. And oh, wow. So, that must have been hard for you guys, no? Yeah, because I had that one horse that was, like, mine. Like, as a kid, you know, everybody had that black beauty kind of horse, and so this was my horse. And to me... What was the name of the, that horse? Blackie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was, she was just a, a small little... Uh, solid black horse gorgeous and everything and you know horses to me are therapeutic because you can talk to them and and they can sense what's going on like they can actually attach to you as well as a rider if you're around them a long time sort of like a dog and thing so you know it was like okay I had it in my head nobody can ride her you know that was my horse but you know I, I was a kid at the time, but we'd go on little trail rides and stuff like that, like just me and her and just talk to her and things like that. It was a way to clear my head, sort of like a one-way diary that I didn't get to write down. Kind of right. Thing. So, you know, basically a psychiatrist that don't, you know, well, a real psychiatrist because they don't tell you shit either. Really? Yeah, well, <laughs> psychiatrists, I mean, they just sit there and doodle on their psychiatrist or psych that's, that's the thing i never had a psychiatrist i've had psychologist or a therapist the psychiatrist is the only one the difference between the, all of them is that that, that that psychiatrist can prescribe medication while the others can't oh i didn't even know the difference yeah, yeah that's the difference between the three mm. and even when you are a therapist counselor or a psychiatrist you also need to be counseled you need to go to a counselor because you're you're receiving a lot of information from a lot of different people on a daily basis, and you have this confident confidentiality that you signed, right? That you cannot say it to anyone else. So if I'm dealing as a psychiatrist that let's say deals with murders, you have to try to understand a pedophile's mind and hear his thoughts. I would go crazy. I don't know because. You know what I mean? Like, he, you, you got to get to know why this man likes to molest little girls. And it's like, who has the balls to sit through something like that? Like, I seriously would just like, ah, you know? Yeah, that's a job I couldn't do. Yeah, I mean. It's intense. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean. <laughs> so, at times, I feel like after hearing case after case, at client after client, it becomes very mundane. You know, if that's your full time. That's why I... As, 
and a part of me, I love therapy and I love psychology. But when I was in high school, I was like, I can't do this full time. I can't see myself going into the same clients, talking about the same thing in my office. I can't. I just could not. So, yeah, you just got to be real with yourself sometimes. Pretty soon you'd want to slap them for not following your advice. You know? I mean, not even that. It's more of like it has nothing to do with my advice. It's just the amount of emotion attachment I will have with each client that I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but also I would go crazy and now think I'm becoming them. There's I'm, I'm a sponge. I soak up energy and I soak up vibes. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing for me. Over time, after, after I've invested so much into my client, I would have eventually dreamt of me becoming the murderer or something. Who knows? You know what I mean? Like it, It's sort of like, you know, that's how actors and actresses are. Because like Heath Ledger, when he went to do The Joker, he did so much research on sociopaths and, and that sort of thing. And yeah, you're right. he became that character of the joker and even jack nicholson when he did the joker back in the original batman he was telling them you don't want to do this part because it will mess you up and ultimately i mean he ended up committing suicide i believe but that was like his last movie was the joker so Damn. it's like it's tough on actors because you got to be able to switch that switch off when you're done acting, acting that character and so it all depends on how engrossed you get to that character now if you sell that character really well in a movie to where even audiences are rooting for you and you're the villain then you did a damn good job with that character but the trick is when you're done filming do you still have some of that characteristics still yeah. with you? I mean, I think psychopath characters are not. I feel like if you're playing someone who has troubles and issues or whatever in a character role as an actress or actor, um, yeah, you'll eventually become that character. Like, look at Jon Snow. You I have know. no idea who that is. Did you never watch Game of Thrones? Are you that guy? Yes, I'm that guy. I don't know. Wow. That's crazy. I am ashamed. I thought you left the house. <laughs> he's all quiet back over in the he's, corner. He's never left the house. Yeah, he stayed. He said he was going to be in the corner. <laughs> Shout out to Joe. Okay, Jersey Media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That out. But no, in general, like... I just never, the, the whole Game of Thrones, I mean, not saying I don't like it. I just never had the time, and plus I probably didn't have the channel you to watch You would like it. it. You would like it. If you do take the time to watch it, I think you would really enjoy it. But he played that character, hold on, because princesses. She can go on ape shit. Make a good guard dog, though. That, that picture makes me hungry. Yes. It's the serial killer. That is dope. Mm -hmm. I like how that is. Serial killer. Yeah, there's Fruit Loops. <laughs> yes. Shout out to I Am Zayn Magazine, okay, for doing that um, fixture and that portrait. Yes, he did that. That was his concept, and I think it was beautiful with the Fruit Loops. But, um, but yes, so he said that he's been playing this character for like the last, I don't know, since Game of Thrones started, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's six seasons in that the last year, literally the last season, he was the most troubled actor out of the whole cast that found it hard to let go of that character that he played. Mm -hmm. He just really was messed up and his wife was trying to be there for him as much as she can, but he just missed Jon Snow so much it was crazy mm. it's like he became one with him that he had to like go and say goodbye and he wasn't ready to right he so he was kind of it. yes he was kind of still stuck in that back and forth kind of switch on and off like you were talking about I mean well you know I mean did you when you went to the psychiatrist in high school or something like oh i never went to one no never went to one at all no no oh, okay i mean some you know if you talk to my exes they'll probably say yeah you need to go to one but no i never did no <laughs> you never went to one i i advise that i think it's really good i think it's very like there's something about being self-aware even if you don't go to one i always say practice self-awareness yeah i mean it's also just something about paying somebody 500 dollars to listen to me i mean just and sit right where, do you have health? Bucks do you have uh, insurance or no? Oh, you mean no? I got insurance, but you know, 
Because insurance, you'd only have to copay, and that would be like fifty dollars a time that you go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Oh well, I wish I would have known that years ago. <laughs> yeah, if you have medical insurance, you just go in there and you pay like half of whatever they would normally charge. I mean, it's pretty handy. You should try it one day. No rush, because you do talk to a lot of people on a daily basis. So. Yeah, I do talk a lot. So in high school. Did you have any friends or anyone that helped you influence or anything of that nature? Did just straight athletes? What is this? Like, why specifically athletic women or why are you so geared towards that? Did you have an athletic growing thing in high school or? I've always loved football in general. Um, I tried out for football, you know, and then it, that didn't work out. It was just too much running for my taste. And I already had it in my head that I was going to go military after high school. So I didn't bother trying to, you know, try to go to college, try to do football and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it was in my head. I just, you know, dad got it to me, work, you know, work. So that's just been my life was just having jobs, working and going back home and, you know, hardly ever take vacations. Uh, Yeah, same. So, I mean, I do have a vacation plan in October where I'm going to go to Vegas for about a week and a half. What so. happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You have fun, my friend. <laughs> uh, whatever happens in Vegas ends up on YouTube. So, um, <laughs> Or in this case, IG. Um, yeah. But depending on COVID, that'll, it's still up in the air. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I always look towards football. You know, and I think as an escape of yeah, the of excitement something. and everything. Because once we didn't have the horses, then wrestling. I got into WWF back in the day, and so I well, had that must wrestling. have been a hard year for you, missing Blackie. Yeah, I know. I mean, that that really was, you know, because then we ended up, you know, it was a change going from you know country life to where now we got. A neighbor living next door you never hear <laughs> that that was crazy and did you ever feel eyes on you when you were or something <laughs> it'd be outside and i mean it wasn't like a, you know a bad type neighborhood i mean we had an old lady next door i'll mow her yard occasionally <laughs> and, i mean i mean and she was sweet and whatnot so she was sort of like the makeshift grandmother to us kind of thing she'll bake cookies or whatever and so that that was pretty cool um always we had that life where during the summer we'd always go stay with either a grandma or an aunt for you know a few months so that was always great but Mm -hmm. then you know as everybody started moving apart that sort of you know because like during one year we'll go visit a relative for thanksgiving and then that that same year for christmas they'll come over to our house as people moved away that stopped and so that was more of an outlet also getting to see cousins and things like that so so you moved away from the ranch life when all your cousins and family were in the ranch life right right so that was the transition right there is because you're going from you're moving away from your family one and then it's kind of a different life. It is a different lifestyle that you have to now get used to. So it was a transition that you had to go through. I mean, how old were you when you were going through that? Oh, I was probably 15, 16 whenever we uh, yeah. moved. Because uh, I remember we drove up here to New York because my mom's from Ithaca, New York. And so we drove all the way from Texas up there to see her childhood home and all that stuff. And I was 15 then. Through all these years in the ranch, besides the horses and athletic, um, or maybe just football or anything of that nature, were there any other music influences or anything that helped you escape from things of that nature? Well, I mean, from I, any I, overwhelming feeling? Or? I, well, I liked instrumental growing up, like especially doing schoolwork. I listened to instrumental music, like Beethoven and all the symphonies that he had, and it just put me in a place to learn better. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Tell me to get me an ice americano. No, you told him to get me a number... Okay, get, tell him to get me an Amer- Americano. Americano? <coughs> yeah, with with milk and, yeah, he knows. With milk and what? And sugar. With milk and sugar. That was an Americano with milk and sugar. 
that's Matt on the phone. He's coming. Okay. I overheard Duncan and I was like, yo, no, wait. So, yeah. Y'all got Duncans all over the place up here. They already have them in Texas. Oh, really? Because no one really drinks coffee over there then. Oh, we drink coffee, but it's... It's probably natural. Well, it's not Dunkin' Donuts. It's like... uh, um, Fill me in. Krispy Kreme. Let me tell you, I have yet to have an actual Krispy Kreme donut from the Krispy Kreme place. And I think there's only one here right around this area on Route 17, and I still haven't tried it. You want to know something? I found a Texas Roadhouse up here, and I like to have cried. I didn't think I would ever see a Texas Roadhouse oh, again. Oh, really? I mean... With milk and sugar. Do you want anything? Dunkin' Donuts? Coffee, cream, sugar. Yeah, coffee, cream, and sugar. I hardly go to Dunkin' Donuts, so it's not like... See, like, if you ask me, what do you want from Dunkin' Donuts? Fuck, I gotta look at a menu. I don't even know. Yeah. You know, But I'll, Krispy Kreme, you know that they got coffees. I'm sure they do, but... Do they? I mean, that's what I'm saying, because well, if they know, had they coffees... Donuts. You know, but mainly. <laughs> so they got donuts. But. <laughs> well, that's what I go. I mean, I'll go get a dozen donuts from Krispy Kreme, but uh, um, mainly it's uh, I'll go to Starbucks if I want, you know, a coffee, or I just go to Seven Eleven. Oh my God! I have to know your signature drink that you order at Starbucks. What is it? <laughs> a strawberry. Well, before they changed it, it was just a strawberry frappuccino. Now it's strawberry banana frappuccino, a venti strawberry banana frappuccino. See, that sounds fancy. (laughs) You could keep up with that. And get this, last one that I got that I found out that they grouped it together and everything was actually at the Starbucks and Trump Tower. And I was like, because I still have a lot to see up in this area. That's crazy. Well, you have the the perfect people around you to to help you. Yeah, I need two of guys. Um... I was watching so many YouTube videos on, like, the scams that are in Manhattan and everything else just so I was prepared because I don't trust nobody. And I don't blame you. You know, it, it was crazy. I mean, people will actually help you, like, as a guide. Like, if you are got a phone out and you're looking at a map or whatever, it's like they can sense what the hell you're trying to do. Like, you're a tourist. You're lost. And they'll help you direct you thinking you're going to give them a tip. And it's like, uh, no, I'm, I don't give tips for shit. Um, yeah. Unless you're at a restaurant, but, um, <laughs> I mean, Touche. yeah, I mean, well, I mean, to all your waitresses out there, that tea glass goes half full. So there's a tip. So, um, it's like, it, it was a new experience it was sort of like the first time i went to vegas i got stationed out in vegas for the military and going from country life hardly any electricity and everything else going to vegas and seeing all the lights and glamour and everything else that was an eye-opener so you went to vegas before you're going to vegas again right the last time i was in vegas i was there 2000 to 2002 so basically it's like a 20-year anniversary going back so you have yet stepped foot in manhattan new york Oh, I did. Okay. Yeah, I, I went there, like, pretty much, like, a year ago, really. I went there, been there about three, four times. And, and so, you feel like Vegas is a little better? Gambling-wise, yeah. <laughs> um, But there's still more to do up here. Like, I see it as I'm in, like, being in Jersey, I'm centrally located from D.C., Baltimore, Philly, Pittsburgh, Boston, Mm-hmm. New York, like everywhere, and all those have football stadiums, and I have a goal of going to each game there. And now I'm getting into basketball for the simple fact that you got Brooklyn Nets up here. Nobody cares about the Knicks, and <laughs> and then Philly. There's some people that do out there. Yeah, I mean, wake up! But um, <laughs> who burned to the Knicks fans? Um, <laughs> well, when you got Spike Lee pissed, so you know. Yeah, at that point. Uh, it, it's like the Knicks are what the Saints used to be back in the day. Oh, wow. Now, I'm a New Orleans Saints fan, so I can say that. Because we used to be the Aints wearing a brown paper bag because we couldn't win nothing for years until Drew Brees came and everything. But, but Yeah, I like yeah. the Saints. I'm converting. I like the Saints, too, even though, you know... 
Drew Brees, you know, we're having an entanglement right now because uh <laughs> Um, word of the week of the month really well after corona that's the word of the year entanglement yeah entanglement. i have yet to figure out totally what that means but it just seems like you know i mean it came from the will smith and jada thing yeah i knew where that came from but it's like okay sort of like when my cell phone was off i could say that you know <laughs> me and my phone provider were having an entanglement with my paycheck and okay so I don't know if that actually makes sense using the entanglement word. But I think, you know, my landlady is having an entanglement with my paycheck because she takes most of it. So I think that's better fitting use of the word entanglement. Like, entanglement? Yeah. Because you're, you're basically not aware of something that someone else is coming to do in your property, in your situation. And okay, that would see, be now I know what the hell entanglement means. That's though. what I feel <laughs> like entanglement is, and it's kind of like, but to me it didn't make sense as you stated because she did want it, right? Right. It's not like she was like, oh, I'm delirious. I don't want it. So maybe Jada wanted that youngster. You know? Exactly. So it wasn't an entanglement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't an entanglement. Was I mean, to me, I think it was an entanglement because when you're in an open relationship and there's three parties, mm. it becomes an agreement, terms and conditions, there's a contract. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait till we start talking about sex with Chronicles. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. We're going to get there. We're going to definitely get there because after this, we're going to do an episode with Matt. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, it's like, I mean, I like... I'm getting used to the whole city life up here. Of course, you know, I'm 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 still country. And <laughs> you know, everybody everybody's like, You're not from around here, is you? No, I'm not. But and I'm not gonna lose my accent, but it's like, you know, I still have the morals, I still have the respect and and that's why, and that's important. Why I feel a lot of the the lady players have gravitated towards me. Because I give them that respect, you know. I, I don't go around, you know, just googly and eyeing them and everything else and talking ill of them and things like that. Because to me, they're not sex symbols. They're women that are trying to better their lives. Some of them are bosses. Oh my God, that is so important. I literally smiled in my eyes when you said that. Because I've literally have been battling that recently where I don't know who to trust. And I am... I guess I'm awake and aware of like how men can see me as the body that I carry before the person that I am. Yeah. And that really has a way with women. It really toys with us. It really makes us question, are we really getting this job position because I've earned it and I've worked hard for it? Or am I getting this job position because you want to get in my pants? Yeah. And see, that that's what's <sighs> tough about that is this so generation, tough. this day and age, because when and even outside looking in when you see a woman that's probably dumb as a brick but <laughs> she's the manager probably only been there six months and manager of several people but you got other people below her that's more skilled than her then you know somebody's bumping uglies to get that position so it's it's shitty that way you know, women are smart. Women can, like, they're, uh, Cynthia Deck, shout out Cynthia. Um, okay, Cynthia. She's the first woman pro athlete to own her own shoe line. And she creates the shoes and everything else. And she's the first, say that again. She's woman. the first woman to have her own shoe line. First woman Frack. athlete. Oh, wow. Um, and so it's i didn't even know like business. so nike and all of these shoe brand athletic shoe brands are made by men well if they're if they're owned by men or owned by a woman i mean i don't know but she's yeah. the first female athlete um and black athlete at that so mm -hmm. um it's a good push for the whole black lives matter movement and no it definitely is things like that so you know she's doing great things and they're all doing great things i mean that's what i mean like when when wednesday comes around and it's like women crush wednesday kind of thing i can't do a single one one 
because and I posted one time I put the whole league on there and I was like you are all a woman crush Wednesday woman crush everything because they all embody something different in their own life that makes them and they you we can learn from each and every one of them right you know I've become real good friends with a couple of them and just listening to their life stories and then they hear mine it's therapeutic both ways because you know like there is one that we've lived similar struggling life like i've been through the homeless stage and she's been through the homeless stage so we had this bond and i had interviewed her once and i'm fixing to drop that uh interview as well and so it was like a uh i'm the first one to actually know about this and so she wanted me to know about it and then i could be the one to release it to oh wow that's very important and very special yeah and she's been blessed recently uh in her life so that was a great thing to see it was a blessing to see when when i mean going to that what age and what time did you go through that the homeless phase i it was let's see 39 it was about eight years ago it was one of the situations like i just uh got out of my first marriage i divorced her and then went, had to move back with mama. Of course, dad didn't like that. Um, of course. It was just, I had to get a job and help mama out kind of thing. That's fine. And so I ended up getting a job like five hours away. And so I would drive and, you know, and camp out at an actual uh, tent campsite in the state park and be there for the week and then come home on a weekend and help mom out. So one day i met up with this one chick and she wanted to borrow my truck to go to see her lawyer or whatever Mm -hmm. well i mean young and dumb i decided to you know let her you know drive my truck while i was at work to go see the lawyer and then bring it back something in my head was like no this don't make you know something's gonna go wrong you know you had that feeling that guilt feeling and sure enough, I get a phone call, and she ended up wrecking the truck, and it was raining or whatever. So, without the truck, I couldn't drive around to, you know, the campsite. Couldn't drive back and forth to work. So pretty much, I lost the job, lost the campsite at the end of the week, and of course, Dad wasn't too happy. So he wasn't about to help out for shit. So you know, Damn. it was one of those tough love kind of situations. Right, but that's too tough to me. Yeah, and it put mom in a bind because, you know, she wanted to help me out, but dad was in charge of everything, all the money and everything else. So that put a strain on that kind of relationship that me and my mom had. And so eventually, Mm -hmm. after about six months, you know, like I, I was too prideful to be on the corner. You know, I wasn't out there holding the sign, things of that nature, because it was just, you know, that. I'm not saying I'm above all that, but it was just the way I was raised. You don't ask for nothing. You yeah. don't beg for nothing. Yeah. You know, That's you, right. you work and you earn what you get. So, you know, eventually, mom would find a way to do the Walmart to Walmart kind of thing and send me some money, or she'll pay for a hotel for a couple of nights and out of her own money because she had this little job like a family dollar or whatever and she'll use her money what she could to you know at least get me your work. mom sounds like a warrior and your best friend yeah and i think she's part cia because <laughs> uh i mean the one time like when i first got in the military and i was heading out to vegas I kept in contact with her, and then I got to Vegas that Wednesday night and talked to her. I said, okay, and I stayed in a hotel before reporting to the base next day. And then reported, talked to her and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And so I was getting used to the base, you know, meeting new people. Of and course. The guys at the barracks were like, hey, come hang out with us. So I was meeting everybody. And I didn't get to talk to her for the whole weekend until Sunday. And... I called her up. I was like, hey, mom, how's it going? What not? And she was like, oh, did you get the message? I was like, what message? Oh, don't worry about it. And the next day I go to work, I get told to go to the colonel's office. Mm. I was like, okay, shit, I'm in trouble. 
And so I go in the colonel's office, and then the first thing he, he asked me was, like, what kind of relationship do you have with your parents? Are y'all on speaking terms kind of thing? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, when was the last time you talked to your mother? Uh, last night and everything. Well, she called me, and I was, I, I turned, like, white. Oh, yeah, like, when you said that? Yeah, because I'm like, I, I swear, I could be lost in this safari desert and a cactus is going to ring and there's going to be a phone in there and it's going to be my mom on the other end of it because how the hell she found like the direct line to the colonel of the base and at, she she told him to get you know to have him tell me to call her like she wanted him to relay that message to me to give her a phone call. Oh my goodness! I'm like, uh, and he ordered me, "Don't get on to your mother. She's just looking out for you and everything." I was like, "Yes, sir." I called her up. What the fuck are you doing? Why are you calling the colonel? I mean, I'm thinking I'm in trouble. <laughs> I mean, but you know, I love her to death, and and she she looked out for me when she could during that time, and you know it it. Basically, I consider myself a survivor, and you take that you take that survival trait and that survival aura that's in you, and you try to outpour it everywhere else around you. And I think that's what you're trying to do now with your platform and how you have it. Is that you shouldn't just be like this? Okay, I'm done. I'm I'm, I'm checked out. I'm exhausted. I don't feel like going no more. Oh yeah, I'm you can't. You can't. There's so much left. You can't. Right. And I think you're the perfect example of that with your story, you know, because a lot of people I know would have stayed in that state for years. Yeah. You know very well what I'm talking about. It's too easy for people to give up nowadays. You know, like people need to realize that you're going to hear the word no so many times, even though no, they say, you know, you don't like hearing the word no. Well, you're going to hear it a lot. There's going to be so many doors slammed in your face trying to progress up, but where one door op- one door closes, another one, one opens. opens. So, I mean, yeah, I'd rather hear, I'd rather somebody tell me the word no, so I know I got to push harder and drive deeper to get to the next level. I think that's what it is. I think just right there, what you said, people are afraid of hearing the no or hearing that because they, they're afraid of trying harder and putting more work or trying the best version or working on a better level. Mm-hmm than where they are comfortable at now. And it's comfortable, everybody likes it, it doesn't have to be changed, so then why do I have to change it? And it's like... And that's the same in relationships, too. Oof, mm-hmm. Like, you know, guys don't want to hear the word no. Women don't want to hear the word no. I mean, women are notorious. It's like, no, <laughs> it's I want, I want, I want, I get, I get, I get. Mm-hmm. But to me, if I can't afford it, I'm going to tell you ass no. You know, and, <laughs> I wouldn't tell you what. No, and just don't get me in that situation where you're like, which outfit looks better, this one or this one? Because I'm gonna pick the wrong damn one anyway. And if I pick the wrong one or if I pick this one, then you got to change your hair, or change your shoes, and it's just uh, crazy. And then I'm gonna cancel the reservations because then there goes another hour of you picking out more shit. <laughs> and I mean, it's just I, I still I'm. Being 39, I still ain't figured out women, but the one thing I do know Mm -hmm. with women is the fact that no matter what, at the end of the day, you still got to treat them with respect. No matter if you're angry with them, if they frustrate you, and women will frustrate a guy, either nagging or about something little, something big, you just can't get mad at that because a woman's going to show you she's going to show you what she wants from Mm -hmm. you yeah and if you don't provide that as a man to her Mm -hmm. then that's when she starts acting up she's going to act towards you the way you act towards her and guys that don't really understand that especially in this generation some women are like that some women are just trifling and like to have the power and like to antagonize people because they don't like to face their own issues and they make it everyone else's um priority actually to make them happy and to fulfill their lives while they're over here antagonizing and making everyone else's lives miserable isn't that hilarious yeah exactly i mean there's it's just there's some i mean that happens only when again a female is a narcissist i feel (laughs) 
in a way yeah in a way i feel like that's how a narcissist female would would come into it and a lot of women can come and cave into that narcissist kind of image when we kind of have been so stuck on this like image of what we want our love language displayed as with a man but then when we get it it's not really what we like it's just because we saw it in movies we saw the the prince and we thought that that's what every girl right. liked mm-hmm. but then once we get it we're like oh i'm not really into he's too nice he's too sweet he's too this he's too that. and it's like so girl don't look at you know what's what you've been seeing on tv because that's obviously not what you're looking for you know we got to find what t- makes us tick not what generally makes every woman tick and what generally every every woman talks about like oh you need to have a man that provide but maybe that woman doesn't need that Right. Maybe that woman loves to be independent and she wants to be the one to hold the bread and wants a house husband. But you haven't gotten to know that because you've been listening to your homegirls and, and your homegirls experiences with her relationships and, and her exes and, and you allow that to come in the way and then you're like, I guess I I guess that was a waste of time. I guess I'm I don't know, I'm gonna go back to this and it's like we do it to ourselves, you know what I mean? So I feel like women we need to kind of be be more open and hearing and not saying that we are listening when we're not. We're just yeah, you listen to enough music to tell you you want this, you know, the classy, bougie, trashy song. You know, <laughs> and, you know it's like there, I'll see so many people, so many women post on Instagram and their stories like, oh, if if he doesn't give you flowers, he ain't shit. Yeah, shit. This yes. Or whatever. But it's like when an actual genuine guy comes along, that's going to actually like on the first date bring you flowers whether you you know oh let me tell you this if a guy brings me flowers on a date i would literally love it i would appreciate it i think that would be amazing but that's my way of love language and i like that because i'm a very expressive person but then my best friend paloma who should be coming eventually later she's the complete opposite i'm a hopeless romantic she can't stand hopeless romantic. She needs guy. She needs a little asshole around her because she's an asshole. So she needs someone to, to, to compliment her her attitude. assholeness. Because yeah. if not, then you're too nice. Eh, I'm turned off. Yeah. So she would be turned off by that. On the first day, you bring me flowers. Ah, eh, you're doing too much. It's not even that deep. <laughs> That's her. Like, Damn, okay. But for me, I'd be like, yes, because I'm affectionate and I'm the loving, you know. But that's what I'm saying. You got it. We have to get to know each woman because each woman is different, and we can't assume, including women ourselves, we can't assume that we're all generically interested in the same thing because we're really not. Mm-hmm. When and you do that, it fucks up with our interests, like our own genuine interests. Like I- I've experienced that yeah, myself. And same. I mean, it's all like. It's sort of like back in school where you took a whole lot of pop quizzes and <laughs> mm-hmm. you're when you go on a day or whatever. And it all starts with communication. If nothing's going to last without communication, no yeah. matter if you're in the relationship, if it's long lasting, if it's just at the very beginning or talking stages, you got to have communication because how are you going to get a good vibe with the person? Yeah, communication. That's what I say, too. Like, actually, um, communication is one of the three main foundations for me to have a healthy, long-lasting relationship. Communication is in there. And compromise and then trust and honesty. Mm -hmm. There's something about communication that instead of me speculating and believing my assumptions in my head over what you have shown me and said to me, you know what I mean? Like, if you don't say these things to me, it gives me an open floor to invent any story in my head. So just say it. Just be honest open and transparent as my favorite speaker says hot (laughs) be hot honest open and transparent that's all it takes let that pride go and just be able to let them know you know what the reason why i lashed out is because you took me back to the time that you know i my ex that was an abusive relationship got mad at me for something and i shouldn't have lashed at you that way i apologize See, th- there's something about doing that as opposed to just, ah, you don't get it, you understand, blah, 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 blah. You know, like, there's... And, uh, and everybody, <laughs> men and women, have a trigger. Yeah. Based on past relationships. Uh, somebody's going to do something, and some, some, and both sides will end up <laughs> pushing it to the point where that trigger goes off, and you're going to fire off. Mm-hmm. But the trick is, is talk about it afterwards. Now, the one thing I can't stand is when... 
I want to talk about it, you know, and I'm still frustrated over it. But then they're like, well, we'll talk about this when you calm down. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. But then we don't end up talking about it. You know, I hate that too. I don't want to talk about it the next day. I can't go to bed angry with whoever it is because I want, I mean, we can, and like with me, when it comes to communication, I'm old school. I'll pick up a phone and I want to have an actual talk and phone conversation. Texting is good Mm -hmm. now and then. Yeah. Not everybody, not every woman likes to talk on a phone. That's fine, you know, but sooner or later we're going to be talking face to face and I'd rather talk on the phone to actually hear the emotion through the voice, Mm -hmm. you know, hear how you're talking because I can't judge emotion through words. Nobody punctuates nowadays. Everybody uses emojis and shit. And I don't understand all the emojis that are out there. So I'm going to, you know, call you. I'll do voice memos in the DM. Right, You right. already know that. I'll voice memo a person to death. You know, a few of the ladies have already said on the voice memo king. Because <laughs> I'll send like 20 of them in a row and get to the point where it's like, we'll just video chat. You know, you got to have... Right. Better communication. You're in the technological world now. Mm -hmm. So video chat. But that's what I'm saying. Where words fail, music speaks. And that's where I always go back to my music therapy side. So there's times where I fail to say something. And because I'm so emotionally involved into something, I can't even express it. You know, so that's where I use music to be kind of my outlet. It can be instrumental. It cannot. It can be something that reminds me and that aids that emotion for that moment or that gets me out of that emotion in that moment. I feel like if I'm angry, I can either play a song that feeds the anger or I can play a song that aids the anger and helps me dissipate and help it go away or distance it a little bit. And if that's the case, I know music that can do all that. I know music that can lower my anxiety and then increase it, you know, just with the fortissimo, like... (laughs) to that nature and and i know like growing up i was all country music okay so So that's where you were growing up predominant genre country and 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 then the second and third after the first divorce it started going into a little pop rock ish and then Mm -hmm. after the second divorce it was just full-on heavy metal and now okay. I, now I listen to everything, a mixture of stuff. Like I'm still a firm believer in the '90s country because, and and not everybody likes country music. I was just gonna say that. Why do you think that? Because they they assume that it's nothing but like you know sad, sappy. You know, I lost my dog or my wife left me and all this shit. But you know, there are some uptick country songs and. But it's, it's like music and, and everything, even 90s hip-hop and R&B, music meant something. Music had soul back in the 90s. Now, you really don't hear much of it. Yeah. And, like, I remember back on the radio station, people would call in and dedicate songs to their significant other or whatnot. Yeah, now you barely hear about that. Now you don't, you can't even request a damn song. It's all done on loops and stuff like that. So it's like... And it's the same rotation of songs. You'll, yeah. you'll hear that Justin Bieber yummy song 20 times in an hour. And well, that's why I stopped listening. I, ne- I stopped listening to the radio like 10 years ago. <laughs> the radio might as well just be full of commercials. Cause no- I mean, I'm just being real. Like after, after streaming became a thing, Val was like, deuces to all my CDs, all my MP3s. I'm doing this app. Dang, I'm doing Spotify, I'm doing Pandora, I'm doing it and doing it and doing it well. But no, I was doing all of them, I was dabbling all of them. Yeah. Because I just felt like this was like like a new world. I was like, all I have to do is pay $5 a month or $10 a month and I get all the music I want. Of course I'm going to pay. And, and that's the same, <laughs> the same thing that happened when DVDs came No out. commercials? And... I mean, there are commercials on iHeartRadio. I mean, every I mean, four or five songs. I don't listen. See, I'm not an iHeartRadio uh, app or Pandora app. But those, those I was, I'm going to include, they do have ads. You could have them without ads. Same thing with Spotify. You could have Spotify without ads if you choose to pay for it. I don't pay for them. I only pay for SoundCloud and Apple Music. That is it. You got an iPhone, don't you? Yes. Yes. Um, so that's why I have it. But Apple Music, I can log into my Samsung phone and mm. download the app. 
and then basically, you know, listen to my Apple Music. Same, same, it will generate the same library just like that. It won't even, and no ads, no nothing. I could listen to my music nonstop. I have playlists for certain things. Like I have a calming, relaxed stretch before I work out kind of playlist. Mm-hmm. And then I have my workout playlist. You know, like you got to have now, different. what's your workout playlist like? Uh, what kind of music? A lot. I have, I have some rap in there. I got some grunniness, some slaughterhouse in there, okay? I got some heavy metal, some system of a down, all of that. Um, I just feel like anything that pop, anything that involves... Say that pop again. Pop. <laughs> I ain't going to let you live that down. Right, right. Yeah. I always say pop that way. But no, like anything that has like an up feel and gives me like life or something like move, bitch, like that's what I'm going to listen to. You know what I mean? In my workout. Because I'll be like in it, just focused, you know, bump yeah. into some biggie. You got to have that adrenaline pumping type music. And that's what rock does to me. Oh, like, that's um, cute. That's sweet. Uh, what kind of um, artist? I like System of a Down. Um, I like Slipknot. I like Falling oh, in Reverse. Yeah, I forgot about that. Now, Falling in Reverse, he... He mixes rap and rock together. There's a song called Losing My Life and Losing uh, My Mind where he talks about his life and what he's gone through, depression, things like that. And he'll rap at the beginning and then he'll throw into the rock. And really? I need to hear that. What it, who is it? Falling in Reverse. Falling in Reverse. I'm going to definitely listen to that. Yeah, you need to. I'm, I mean, I want to... I, I, it's like later or whatever, I want to actually... He let you watch the video listen he's got like four of them out three of them are in a row like a movie kind of oh wow series mm-hmm. and, and he's a rock he art, has or no just genre. he has no genre he's, he's a mixture a, that's what it sounds like yeah he's really no genre he's like rodney radke the lead singer he is his genre mm. and i love artists that can do that <laughs> i respect he, them he, he, here there's one called the drug and me is reimagined which is a I guess you could say softer. Like he did, he's got one called The Drug and Me Is You. Mm-hmm. Well, he redid it, which is the reimagined part, but he did it on piano and everything. So he did it like an acoustic version that most people do, but it wasn't acoustic, it was just piano. And so he. Can, so the song that you were talking about that he did, what was it about? Him biting, fighting, going back from his depression and then back from. Right. Uh, losing. Uh, my life was basically in in my mind the way it was brought to me was uh mm-hmm. he gets lost like into his yeah. work into his craft that basically he didn't have time for his daughter and then years go by and then finally he wakes up to the point like his daughter's grown and it's like damn. damn so he missed a lot of time that he didn't notice because he was stuck in his mess right exactly and so it gets real deep with his music because it's, and that's what I like about it because it actually is tailored on his own. When you life. were going through any of these transitions in life, leaving your ranch, going into a new neighborhood, or even when you were going through your homeless phase, mm-hmm. did you have, I know you've mentioned that outside of your divorces, you've used music as an outlet but in that time did you have a song specifically that you would listen to at least to try to calm you down in those times for a month or two or just for some reason you just resorted to or just went to there are several <laughs> there are several songs like one of them is uh yeah give me a lyric too yeah uh from uh, uh hinder called i hate everything about you and so that was like the theme song to the ex-wife. Um, <laughs> and, I can see that. Do what? Three Days Grace. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, Dang, Joe knew that. Three Days well, Grace. Well, Look at you. Popular song, you know. Of course, I get it mixed up. But and did then, your mom listen to that, Joe? No, nah, I listened to it. Oh. It wasn't like an old school. Rock. It was like it was, oh, yeah, it was nineties, two thousand. Okay. Early. And. Uh, um, Five Finger Death, Death Punch had uh, A Thousand Ways to Hate, and that was a good song. No, I know you've heard that song. A Thousand Ways to Hate? I hate everything about you. No, I don't think I have. Give me a lyric. He just said it. <laughs> he says, like, I know you know it. I hate your hopes. I hate your fucking... 
hate your mom, hate your, he hates everything about, that's the other one, that's not Five Finger. Yes, I know it. Our coffees are here. I'm excited. <laughs> but yeah, that that song was like the anthem at the time. There was something about the words, right? <clears throat> yeah, because it just edified and reassured everything you were feeling. <laughs> the hatred and everything, you know, is it's like I didn't want to feel alone in my hatred. So I grouped it all together into that song. You know? Yeah, so yeah. I, I just found all the heavy metal songs that had to do with. Hold hatred. on, hold on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, Liam. Hi, how are you? Okay, so you you were saying. <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> right, I know. Um, you were on. Oh, yeah, I grouped up all my anger and all the heavy metal songs. Okay, yeah, so you grouped up all your anger and oh, so, so it just edified and reassured everything that you were feeling when you left your divorce in that situation. Damn. Mhm. I I mean it's like you know how like you have music that you could say that calms you down and then stuff like that. I don't know if I got music like that because you just, I just said listen. it though because you said that you listen to a lot of instrumentals. Well, yeah, as a kid to help me learn and stuff like that, but I haven't really just sat and listened to an instrumental like during those times. It was uh, just but instrumentals do provide you peace. Oh yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure you know. So I just were you ever brought up in church growing up or not really we were like we were given a choice if we wanted to go great fine we could go um my uncle was a nazarene preacher so like when we go visit them we had to go to his church Mm -hmm. but other than that i mean we were faith-based but it wasn't like a mandatory thing where we had to go shout out to joe i mean to matt Matt gave us some Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Lovely, important nonsense host. Gotta love him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Good shit. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, well, now I gotta watch my cousin who's young and around. Um, I mean, yeah, that's true. Well, they ain't heard it from me. So. <laughs> you know, I mean, I cuss and everything else, but it's like you have it boils down to the whole respect thing. There's a time and place for it, you know, joking around or whatever. Then yeah, cuss like a sailor. No, you're giving me a different perspective. You're th- you're definitely giving me a different perspective um, on it uh, because I do some. That is something that I do on the regular, especially now with the podcast and stuff. But. It's something that I have in and out because I've been hearing a lot of feedbacks and certain people when saying and the cursing and everything like that. It's like it's it's everyone's preference, you know, personal preference. Some people like it, some people don't. Well, it's just like Steve Harvey said, you know, she cusses. <laughs> you know, it's a stress relief. You know, you could say it and you feel better. And so, you know. Yeah, but once you say it, that's that, right? Yeah, but when it gets to the point where the F word is a comma in every sentence, then, you know, that's probably too much. But it depends on the word usage and depends on the situation that you're using them. Now, I'll make a sailor blush with shame. Right. But, you know, like I said, like you, there's two times I don't cuss, and that's around kids and preachers. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's, that's nice. <laughs> so you were brought up around. Gotta have some groundage, you know. Gotta yeah, no, definitely. Sometime. Definitely. So now I wanted to also ask, this is the, the one question that I always ask every um, guest that comes on the show. Mm-hmm. When you were going through the homeless transition and everything of that nature, or even then through your life, through your mistakes, through your failures, what do you advise someone when that bounces back, that has to bounce back, that has to, the capability of getting back to that ground that they feel they're so impossible to touch or reach? What do you have to say to that person? Don't give up. Like keep. Hold on, give me one second. <laughs> we got a farthing new. What's the time? Good. Okay.
look like a wall with legs. <laughs> I can't with y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, he, you know, he's the brother from a different father. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, so yes. So let's let's go back to that question. So yes, so going through your times of transition, through you being homeless, through you leaving your ranch, through anything of those times, depression, leaving your divorces, going through your failures or mistakes, how did you get back? How did you bounce back? How did you have that resilience or that energy? Because let me tell you, when you're in those p- places, you are exhausted emotionally physically and you just don't feel like continuing or going forward so i just really wanted to know what do you advise a person of that nature you personally going through that it, the advice i'd give is just you gotta have a goal you know when you get to that point yeah your mental starts playing tricks on you starts messing you up like mm-hmm. oh i'm a failure what was me kind of thing but it gets to the point where you just got to keep knowing that you will get out of this. Like, you're not stuck in mud forever. Eventually, the sun will dry out the mud and you'll be able to get out. What were some things that you did to help you get out of those little ruts? Like, did you practice, like, a routine? Did you pick up a hobby? Did you try doing something different a day? Yeah, every day was something different. Like, of course, you know you did what you needed to to survive mm-hmm. like you found soup kitchen stuff like that and eventually you know i saved up the money mm-hmm. that mom was sending me and then moved back and moved back up there with mom kind of thing yeah but you know my dad and see my dad worked in new orleans so so your dad is from new orleans no uh, <laughs> lived in new orleans just worked there oh, okay that's pretty cool yeah uh i've only been there once i mean my sister lives there now but uh you need to visit your sister shout out where's what's her name jenny jenny yeah we i mean we we really don't have that kind of a you know bond kind of thing just because the way we were growing up it was like we talk shit back and forth to each other uh but you know, she she does her own thing. I've done my own thing. And, you know, I have a daughter, but, you know, that that was with the first marriage and whole craziness with that one. That's a whole another eggshell. Right. And so she's always harping on me. Did you talk to her? Did you talk to her? All this stuff. And it's like, it's beyond me. Like, I could send emails, I could mail letters, but whether she's going to get them or not, because the current family is another is a whole other thing. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, it's been, you know, seven years, eight years since I've last seen my daughter. Not because, you know, I'm some deadbeat or whatever, because she's still getting child support and everything else. And I, I made So you only have, you have a, one daughter? Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. You didn't tell me that. What's her name? You didn't ask. Um, Almeida is her legal name on the birth certificate. Almeida. Almeida, yeah. I named her after my grandmother, which is my dad's mom. And uh, she's like the main grandmother that taught me how to cook, taught me how women should be treated kind of thing in the old school way. It's always the grandmothers. Shout out. It's always grandma, yeah. Um, Because dad was the one that taught us the work ethic and taught my sister how to change a tire and stuff she he taught her the things to survive as far as that goes how to so i mean that, that now makes sense going through your divorces you kind of felt like you were stripped away from everything not just the love of your life but that you thought it was the love of your life right. but the actual love of your life which is your daughter you know yeah i tried you know like when you go through the separation of the divorce and stuff you might be able to have like a friendship with the baby mama kind of thing and we tried that it lasts about a month and so and see the thing was that i gave her three chances like the first time she cheated i was like Mm -hmm. you know it was her family more or less that said you know give her another chance if she messes up we can't say that you didn't try to keep it together because they were real heavily christians they didn't believe in divorce and all that stuff I don't know why, because... I mean, Pentecostals normally tend to grow to that route. Yeah, even though she had three uncles by three different dads, so... 
it didn't make sense to me, but, you know, um, so I gave her the chance there, and then she did it a second time, and then I, that time, my love for her went away, and I just stayed for my daughter at that time. And then once she did it that third time, I mm-hmm. just had enough, and I just, you know, I, I moved out, and that, that was the hardest thing, because that was, you know, I felt I was losing my life at that time, and because you know she's daddy's girl Mm -hmm. when she come visit us at at mom dad's house and because they still live out in the country i taught her how to shoot bb gun and everything else my dad got her little daisy the daisy red rider bb gun but it was like pink handle with pink buttstock and we took a picture of all the gifts that she got for christmas because the baby mama wanted to see a picture of all the gifts and dresses yeah. and stuff mm-hmm. she didn't care about the nice dress she had on she saw that bb gun box and she came mm-hmm. unglued she's like she's not bringing that bb gun here and everything else i'm like okay that's fine she's keeping it here and she didn't want her being around it and everything else i'm like you married into a family that respects guns and has guns everywhere and guarantee you they're loaded and so Mm -hmm. that that was the struggle leaving her but uh but yeah let's see 2007 was she when she was born so i think she'll be 13 in november yeah yeah for sure so yeah it's, it's been a minute but it's it you know in our family it's one of those things where it's like out of sight out of mind and right. so i mean know. now looking forward to everything that you've gone through and even now and how you're blessing everyone else through your experiences and through your story you're choosing your life to not define you and not hold you back and i love that about you and i've said that he's choosing to edify and talk to a lot of people on the same cause that he's going for which is supporting athletic women not for just their bodies not just because they are these physical beings, but because they actually have respect. They should be treated with respect because of their personality and because of who they are. So going forward, like now, with this whole thing that you started, and you said you started this podcast not too long ago, like when? like I started it in March. March? This year? Yeah, this year. Oh, wow. March started the IG live part, Mm -hmm. and then April, I started releasing episodes of the podcast and uh so it started out being a fan and then even the the league themselves they have their own little ig live podcast kind of thing and Mm -hmm. they've even told me they were like you're you're the mascot basically Mm -hmm. you know because they didn't know who it's sort of like when like say you know like i'm meeting you for the first time you know, your perception of me is you really don't know who I am, what I am, how I am, what kind of personality I have right. until you get to know me. And, I, you know, I come around more often and you start to see, you know, especially when it's on IG. There's like, who's cowboy? Who's motherfucking cowboy? And then once you start seeing more posts or more of this or that, you start to get a handle on what type of person, you know, I would be. And once they started seeing me come around and notice that I wasn't there in a negative way, but all positive, right? You know, they they knew me. I got most recognition because I would always talk shit. <laughs> uh, like, because well, that's how you initially got the crowd and the audience to get to you, right? You because talked shit you, every time yeah. they would post a new team mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. a new player going to a team. They would have their caption, and I would just say some off the wall shit talking thing out there and then people will get you would get a couple responses of course because yeah and then whenever i hopped in there and then uh shout out to loopy rose the creator of the league uh she was like you know she, she said oh well, i fuck with cowboy because she always sees me you know commenting Being, on mm-hmm. everything and it's all and i t- let everybody know that it's all love it's all you know fun and games i'd never say anything mean about it i just but that's kind of stuff that engagement is what puts your name out there and what what you're pretty much branding yourself and marketing yourself by doing that right more engagement more time people see you putting inputs the more that they'll want to now ask for your inputs as opposed to you just freely giving them Exactly, mm-hmm. and now like that M- M- F- M- F- Cowboy's gonna go up. I want to see what you gotta say. Yeah, you know, yeah. I want to see who's gonna interview. Who's this gonna be? That exactly. Yeah, and you know, and it's actually opened a, a few doors where now I'm a contributing sports writer 
for the league on a on a global women's sports radio and so every week i drop an article spotlighting a different player and so i basically just write up wow know, that's my amazing point on mm-hmm. them like a critique kind of thing and it just, and how did you get that they were just they, they, felt- they hit me up in the dm they were like you know i like what you're doing uh, would you want to write for me on my you know uh, website and kind of thing i was like Fuck sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, so, that's awesome. Uh, so I'm doing. So that. that's how you know you're in the right path. You're doing exactly what you're, what you like, you enjoy. Mm-hmm. You're and providing. I have a way with words because mm-hmm. I'll I'll type it up, and to me it doesn't sound. I didn't go to writing class. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I I spoke English. I didn't care about writing essays, but apparently when mm-hmm. I get pen and paper together or a finger and screen together, mm-hmm. I can create. Uh, like the the guy had said that he likes how detailed I am when I'm writing, and it brings the audience into that story of my viewpoint on the player. Right. And so you know, it's just I have that knack for for words, and so. Shh. Damn, peanut <laughs> gallery back there. I <laughs> know. Um, but go uh, ahead. Yeah, it's it's been enjoyable. It's been a been a uh, quite a ride, and and you know, my mom always told me never count your chickens before they hatch. So mm-hmm. you know, I'm not looking f- for anything from the league, like per se. I'm not trying to get on with any yeah. team or whatever. I'm doing this as a hobby for now. If they hit me up and they were like, "Hey, you want to do this? You know, get paid for it." Yeah, of okay, course. Fine, you know, no problem. But right now, it's just something fun to do. And I enjoy meeting the new players, enjoy meeting players, getting to know them, established friendships. There's a few players that I consider my sisters Mm -hmm. from day one. Of course. And so where we we talk pretty much daily about what's going on away from football and, and stuff. So it's actually pretty cool. Well, that's awesome. I I'm, thank you for coming. I thank you for sharing what you've had with your podcast. I wondered what the hell that little tapping was. Oh, I always do this. Oh, okay. I play with my hands a lot. It's something that I do. I'm trying to work on it. I also play with my hair a lot. It's something that I need to work on. Working on it. Yeah, we ain't in gonna, progress. We ain't gonna play poker because that would be a tale. To be honest, I, that's why I don't play poker because I don't have a poker face. I show I show all of my emotions in my face. It would be a fail. Mm-hmm. Oh, but if now that you play poker, I'm gonna invite you to that poker night that that you hit me up on the DM about. Yeah, as long as don't forget happens. about it because it's gonna happen. Oh yeah, poker, spades, bones. I don't matter what it is. I play it all. Of course. Um, is there anything? Oh, just just before we leave, I just want you to um, let us know if anything that you have coming up, any shows that you want us to be in, you know aware about. Well, this uh, every Sunday I have a X's and O's with Coach Mentors, which uh, Coach Mentors just became the head coach of the Los Angeles Fames football team for the WFLA. So yes. big big props to him; he deserves it. And so every Sunday we have we break down football plays and that stuff from his point of view. And some some Sundays we just talk football, talk sports, just two guys chatting it up kind of thing. So Sundays you can check him out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. then everything else you kind of just announce it on your post and right. stuff like just, that. Uh, basically follow me, uh, MF Cowboy on Instagram. And what's the name of your podcast? Cowboys Corner Podcast is the name of it. Um, so that's I wanted them to know. That's all. <laughs> Because it's not going to be MF Cowboy. It's going to be... Yeah, Cowboy's Corner Podcast is the main thing. And where can we find that at? You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, every listening platform you could think of. Okay. Ones I've never even heard of. <laughs> podcasts on there. Stitcher. I didn't know what the hell Stitcher was, but it's on Stitcher. Of course. And Outcast or something. No, thank you for coming on. Thank you for blessing us with your story. I appreciate thank it. Thank you for, you know having me on it was i was been looking forward to i know on you, the show i literally finally met him and i'm so grateful you came out yeah virtual <laughs> hug you know virtual we, we, we got four and a half foot so. <laughs> yes and you guys can follow me of course on reflections with val